Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you all for joining us. My name is David Staley, and I'm uh, director of the Goldberg Center, which is the Digital Public History Center of the Department of History, and an associate professor from the department at Ohio State. This is another in our series of the Clio Society Public Lectures. Clio, uh, named in honor of the Greek muse of history. Clio Society is a public lecture series that connects the Department of History faculty to the wider community. We are once again very pleased to uh, host this lecture at the Whetstone Library rather than a location on campus, which is an effort on our part, I think, to reach out even further into the community in which we serve. The Department of History takes its land grant mission very seriously, and I hope you see lectures like these, like the Clio Society, as proof of that commitment. If you would visit clio.osu.edu, C-L-I-O, clio.osu.edu, you can see videos of our previous lectures. And I note that our next lecture in the series will be on Monday, March 21st, the same room, the same time. Uh, Patrick Patiandi will present how the history of Poindexter Village challenges popular stereotypes about public housing. You may remember Poindexter Village as the, the first public housing project in Columbus that has since been raised uh, in the course of the 1990s. There are flyers for this event, or there were flyers uh, in the back here. Uh, and we also have in the back a, a list, uh, We would, uh, if, if you'd like to volunteer your email address, and we'll send out uh, periodic reminders about our Clio Society events. Stephen Malent and Craig Zimfer, two alumni of our department, are the driving forces behind the Clio Society, both of whom have a passion for history that I know is shared by everyone in this room. Steve has said of the Clio Society that if you loved history as an undergraduate, then you're going to love it now. I think that'll be very much the case, I think, with the, the talk we're going to hear this evening. It is my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Hassan Jeffries. Professor Jeffries is the author of Bloody Lounge, Civil Rights and Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt, which recounts the stories of the activities of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who ushered in the Black Power era by transforming rural Lowndes, rural Lowndes County in Alabama from a citadel of violent white supremacy into a center of Southern black militancy. Hassan's book has been praised as, these are quotes, the book historians of the black freedom movement have been waiting for, and as an invaluable contribution to understanding current and future conversations on race and politics. And as that last quote indicates, Hassan Jeffries is indeed a national leader in engaging us in such conversations about race <coughs> and politics, as he will do with us here this evening. His talk is titled, Making Sense of the Madness, Race, Racism, and, the Poli and Politics in the Age of Obama. Please join me in welcoming Hassan Jeffries. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dave Daly uh, and Ohio State's History Department, uh, Department's Clio Society, for extending the invitation uh, to share a few words this evening. It is really a delight and pleasure to be uh, with you today, to be in the community, uh, to be off the campus of The Ohio State University, a lovely campus, but it's nice to be out in the community. But it's especially nice to be out in the community uh, with so many familiar faces. Uh, students who are current uh, as well as past, two students who uh, we just had a graduate <laughs> seminar today for three hours, so I know you must be tired of me, but I thank you for coming uh, nonetheless. Uh, friends from the community, new and old, uh, it is good to be, to be with you uh, this evening. It's good not to be in New York. I'm originally from New York, uh, and right now they're facing 30 inches of snow, so it's especially good to be here in Ohio at the current, at the current moment. Uh, the title of my talk this evening uh, is Making Sense of the Madness. Making Sense of the Madness. Race and Racism uh, and Politics in the Age of Obama. Race, Racism, and Politics in the Age of Obama. Well, race and racism uh, have always shaped the contours uh, of modern politics, especially modern presidential politics. But ever since the election of Barack Obama, uh, the degree and intensity of racist rhetoric in presidential politics, especially 
uh, has intensified exponentially. This evening I want to uh, just spend a few minutes, if you will, examining and exploring some of the reasons uh, for this development uh, and also touching upon some of the possible policy implications uh, if we continue, continue down, down this road. All we have to do today uh, is literally turn on the television uh, or turn on the radio, uh, tune in uh, to seemingly any Republican presidential candidate uh, and, and stand clear <laughs> and, and just listen. Uh, if we think about uh, early last year when, when Donald Trump announced his candidacy uh, the, for the Republican presidential, prime, Republican presidential nomination. Uh, he did it uh, with a grand gesture of love towards our neighbors to the south, Mexico, uh, referring to uh, them, referring to Mexico as, as sending over, uh, crossing over our borders, bringing drugs uh, and crime, uh, and along with all of their rapists, uh, welcome to the Republican Party, apparently. Uh, and an interesting thing happened at that moment when, when, when Trump sort of announced his presence uh, in this particular way. Most uh, of your uh, political pundits looked at that and said, oh, well, my goodness, he's, he's clearly, this isn't going anywhere, right? Like, how, how could he? And then they immediately put the microphone uh, in front of him and said, okay, don't you want to walk that back? And he said, no, I don't want to walk it back. In fact, I'm going to double down. Uh, they are not only rapists, but they're also murderers. Uh, and he continues on and on and on. And it only got better from there. Uh, next on the list was, well, what do you want to do with those Mexicans? Mexicans, substitute for immigrants who are already here. Oh, that's a simple solution. Uh, we send them back, uh, you know, round them up, send them back. How do you keep them from coming back? A simple solution, build a wall. Uh, well, what about Muslims? Well, we'll take care of them too. We need to start going into mosques at a certain point, following the Paris thing, uh, Paris attacks, and, uh, and on and on and on it went. Uh, Donald Trump, of course, not to be out-Trumped, uh, by his, his fellow candidates uh, seeking the nomination in the Republican Party, uh, spared no expense, signing on very early on uh, to possibly banning Muslims uh, to prevent any kind of uh, terror attacks uh, in the United States following uh, the assaults and tragedies in uh, Paris calling for a ban on Syrian refugees, uh, Ted Cruz and so many others. Our own uh, governor here in Ohio didn't miss a beat uh, in rallying to the cause of banning uh, refugees coming from Syria, uh, to part two, banning them from coming into the United States. Islamophobia, racism, anti-immigration rhetoric, criticism of New York social values. <laughs> I take personal offense to that. Sort of has become the, the various watchwords of the day, have really become to define uh, what this presidential primary is all about. Now, the interesting thing that has happened, uh, particularly on the Republican side, no worry, I'll get to the Democrats, uh, eventually, there's nothing uh, inherently uh, wonderful about the Democratic Party. I'm, I'm an equal opportunity uh, political, uh, uh, I will offer equal opportunity political critique. Um, but a strange thing happened, a funny thing happened. Uh, as you have this, this a ratcheting up, like we haven't seen in quite some time of this, of, of really what is racist rhetoric. The poll numbers of those uh, who were offering uh, these, these critiques went up and held steady. 
And when you're talking about politics and presidential politics, uh, there, is a, there is a trend to follow the poll numbers. And so we ought not be surprised uh, if other presidential candidates would chime in, uh, would also uh, begin to embrace, at least rhetorically, some of these statements and, and, and policies. And that's what we have. So the question then becomes, why the support? Is it, is it a question of uh, these individual candidates, individuals, like a Donald Trump or a Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio, whoever it may be, is it, is it that they are offering ideas and policies and thoughts regarding immigration, regarding uh, Christianity and Muslims and terrorism and African Americans and crime and the like? Are they offering something unique? Are they leading the pack or are they responding to sentiments that are existing already, that are percolating somewhere in America that simply have bubbled up to the surface? And I think to answer this question, you have to go back, take a step or two back in time. So if this is 2015, 2016, uh, if we look back at the last presidential election 2012, we really begin to see there uh, serious disappointment focusing on uh, the Republican side uh, of the presidential race. We see real disappointment uh, in the establishment. We hear a lot about that, the establishment candidate. The establishment candidate, uh, the person who eventually uh, headed up the ticket, uh, being Mitt Romney. Real criticism, not so much from those who were the establishment, those who were fiscally conservative, uh, running the Republican Party, they were okay. But those who were socially conservative uh, were especially critical, disappointed uh, in the fact that a Mitt Romney uh, could win the presidential nomination. At that time in, in, in 2012, uh, those who were uh, social conservatives, those who were far right, if you will, uh, were not in a position at that time uh, in terms of their electoral mobilization uh, to carry the day. Uh, now, it is yet to be seen whether or not uh, they will be able to carry the day today. Uh, we will have to see after Iowa, we will have to see after New Hampshire, once these primaries come through, if there's a, a political apparatus, uh, organizing apparatus in place uh, for them uh, to begin to win at the presidential level. Uh, but we only need to go back just a handful of years before to 2010 uh, to see that what we're hearing now in terms of rhetoric being espoused by presidential candidates is really echoing uh, the sentiments that were bubbling up from the surface and first saw electoral success in 2010 at the state level and in uh, congressional elections. Because in 2010 is when we begin to see, or when we really have, sort of the first wave of Tea Party success. This is Barack Obama's first midterm election. Uh, and there we begin, we have uh, a number of uh, Tea Party candidates, not so much successful at the congressional level yet, that will come in 2012, where they push out those blue dog Democrats, fiscally conservative Democrats, uh, but in the state legislatures. So it's in 2010 where we have this wholesale sweep in states like Ohio, uh, North Carolina, uh, where even in Congress, uh, the Democratic majority loses, Republicans regain control uh, of, of, of Congress. Uh, that is a result of a groundswell on the conservative side of the political spectrum. A groundswell that was a response to the 2008 election of Barack Obama. If we go back to 2008, uh, the 2007 electoral campaign, presidential campaign, uh, something very interesting happens uh, if, we, if, we, if we just remember back a few years uh, with Barack Obama and race as he runs for office. And that is he ran as far away from race as he possibly could. Physically, he ran away from it. 
If you remember all of those uh, campaign rallies, 75,000 people, 100,000 people, where were they? In Denver, Colorado. It wasn't Detroit. Uh, physically, Barack Obama distanced himself from being associated with the African American community. You don't see him standing in front of tens of thousands of African Americans. Could have easily been done, but he avoids it. Symbolically, he was stepping away from race. Rhetorically, he was stepping away from race as well. When we think about his Philadelphia speech on race, uh, what he is saying there uh, in part is racism is an American problem, its roots are deep, uh, but let's not cast blame on, on those who are with us now. It really is a problem that, is, that stems from an older generation. And that essentially all we have to do moving forward uh, is wait for that older generation, I guess that includes my parents, to die off <laughs> and the things will come, will, will get a little better. Right? Uh, classic sort of, you know, sort of not quite colorblindness in terms of its analysis, but that the, the problems of, of, of racism today are really just problems of old attitudes. He's stepping away from race in terms of a serious structural analysis. So he distances himself from it uh, physically, he distances himself from it uh, rhetorically in this moment, and he also distances himself from race in the African American community philosophically. <coughs> Saying, I don't want to have anything to do you know, with, uh, or I'm going to step away from Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who was his pastor. And that personal distancing was really a distancing from the, African, the politics of the African American community. Because what was the issue there? Simply a critique of, of American foreign policy following, leading up to 9-11. <coughs> so politics that resonated with the African American community, Barack Obama separated himself from. So the irony is Barack Obama goes through, in this 2008 election, goes through all these mental gymnastics to distance himself on this question of race. Not running away from the fact that he's an African American, but saying, Look at me as an individual first. Don't associate me with the African American community because as we all know, in the 21st century, Amer in 21st century America, white Americans can be very comfortable with individual African Americans who they assume that they know, especially those who are in the limelight, have been doing it for many a year, embracing an African American athlete, embracing an African American entertainer. Uh, loving Oprah Winfrey. Why? Because she's on TV every day for 25 years. You feel you get to know her. You, see, you can see beyond their individual race. But that doesn't mean that you drop the stereotypes that exist about the African American community as a whole. And Barack Obama was very clear. His campaign staff was very clear. Campaign strategists. They understood that individual African Americans can be accepted into positions of power and authority today as long as they're not seen or as long as they can be disassociated from the larger African American community. Because the politics of the larger African American community, the questions of patriotism and loyalty of the larger African American community still come into question. And so when Barack Obama is elected to office, that's when we begin to hear this rhetoric of let's take back America. Take it back from who? But the mobilization that happens in 2010 is a direct reflection of what happens in 2008. There was so much talk about this was a moment of hope, and certainly it was, but also that this was a, a movement. This was the beginning of a movement, a progressive movement. But I think history will, will show, will tell, will record that the movement that came out of 2008, the election of Barack Obama, was not on the progressive left. It was on the conservative right. Because the mobilization that was a direct result of the election of Barack Obama emerges on the left, emerges on the right, and leads to that uh, uh, Tea Party conservative takeover in 2010 with these state legislatures that are then able to enact these particular public policies, such as various voter suppression laws and the like. 
So how do we get to that point in 2008? When seemingly things had been getting quieter as they revolved around race and racial rhetoric. Well, in 2004, 2004 presidential uh, uh, campaign, presidential race, one of the major issues uh, that was put before uh, voters uh, revolved around gay marriage. And of course, here in Ohio, there was an anti-gay marriage amendment, and one of the uh, ways in which that was racialized uh, by the uh, Republican Party, by Dick Cheney, standing for the Republican Party, was like, look, we can use this as a way to create a wedge and peel off a handful of African American voters who are socially conservative, connected uh, with, with large me mega churches. It was a play to an inherently socially conservative African American community when it comes to social issues. But the longer history of, of black politics or politics in the African American communities, the African Americans, there's no secret, African Americans are, when you, by all statistical measures, socially conservative. But they tend not to vote their social views, their socially conservative views. But this was a direct play for that. There was a realization in 2004, in that presidential election, that also reflected what happened four years earlier when George Bush ran against uh, Al Gore. And this was an extension of that. And that was that you don't need to disenfranchise a large number of people, especially people of color, especially those who traditionally vote Democratic, in order to win the White House. that the days of wholesale disenfranchisement are no longer needed. And so what happens? In Florida, essentially, those who had been thrown off of the voter registration books disqualified uh, because they either had a felony record or their name uh, matched that of somebody who had a felony record and therefore were disenfranchised. Uh, was enough to win Florida, and therefore enough to win the presidency. <clears throat> There's a realization moving into 2000, the 2000 election, that reaches over into 2004, that then becomes manifest in the voter suppression state legislative laws that we begin to see popping up in 2008, certainly 2010, 2012, that Supreme Court then says is okay in their ruling, taking out uh, the key, uh, key provision of the Voting Rights Act that says you can make it more difficult to vote. Which you would think would be very un-American, but in fact, when we look back at history, is very American. Voter exclusion is the American tradition, not voter inclusion. There's a brief moment, and we see it following uh, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So from 1965 to about the year 2000, to that Bush v. Bush v. Gore election when we have a new uh, push for voter inclusion, an expansion of the electorate like we hadn't seen uh, since the vote was extended uh, to women, some 45 years earlier. In 1965, when you had the passage of the Voting Rights Act, you're now opening up the franchise. And we see not only African Americans, people of color, registering to vote in mass, almost immediately, but we also see whites vote registering in mass in response to African Americans registering in mass. So we see a surge both on uh, progressive sides and conservative sides as a result of uh, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And 
across the board support for those protections. So we will go through the late 60s, through the 1970s, in through the 1980s, with, and even into the early 1990s, without major efforts to roll back the vote. But that doesn't mean that there weren't efforts uh, to infuse race into politics and into presidential politics. We see it uh, in the 1980s when uh, Ronald Reagan uh, runs for office, choosing in 1980 to launch his presidential campaign. Uh, a California governor, uh, not in the Bear State, not in the great state of California, uh, but in the Magnolia State, in Mississippi. And not just anywhere in Mississippi, uh, but in Philadelphia, Mississippi, which is where three civil rights workers uh, were murdered uh, in 1965. That was no accident. His bus didn't take a wrong turn and wind up in Philadelphia, Mississippi. He was sending a very explicit message uh, to white Southerners that I am on your side. That was a very explicit message. And he invokes the term states' rights, which was a euphemism for we don't want Negroes voting. And this is in the 1980s. So he gets elected in 1980. And then we see, but you, because you have these voting rights, because you have the Voting Rights Act, there's limits to what can be done in terms of voter suppression. Congress is on board with it. Supreme Court is on board with it. And so what happens? Efforts to limit Black political advancement gets concentrated in the hands of the Justice Department. And the Reagan Justice Department begins to target not African American voters, but African American elected officials. So the Civil Rights Era and uh, the uh, Southern uh, organizing to, in opposition to sort of civil rights organizing. Uh, but the beginning of a wave of mass incarceration. Uh, and so those two go hand in hand because the felon, the felon disenfranchisement uh, that is invoked in 2000 really takes root in the 1980s as it's connected uh, to evolving drug policy. So you will have literally tens of thousands of African Americans who will uh, lose their right to vote uh, because of felony charges connected uh, to felony arrests, et cetera, convictions connected uh, to drug policy uh, that then manifests itself uh, in, in future elections. This is policy emerging out of the 1980s, uh, but that is also reinforced and expanded uh, under the Clinton administration uh, in, the 19, in the 1990s. It is extremely racialized uh, politics at the highest, at the highest level. Uh, back to 1965, and just a few more things, uh, and then we'll throw it open for for, for, for conversation, because uh, I don't want to knock out two people <laughs> <laughs> talking about presidential politics. But uh, 1965, when we think about race and we think about presidential politics, becomes critical not just uh, or, or for two reasons. One, uh, it's it's about language, uh, and we talked about this a little bit earlier in class. Uh, this idea of, uh, of law and order. When we think about uh, the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, and we think about race, of course you have a massive disenfranchisement of African Americans uh, in the South, uh, and uh, white Southerners were very clear, very explicit uh, about what they were doing and the reasons for it. Uh, this was not something new. They said, we do not want black folk to vote. Uh, they said, we have been saying that since the 1890s, since the end of Reconstruction, uh, and we have pursued policies to maintain that. We are clear we do not want white uh, African Americans to vote, plain and simple. Uh, but by the time you move into the, uh, after the Voting Rights Act, the early 1960s, uh, late 1960s, uh, we begin to see uh, the use of code language, uh, certainly with Barry Goldwater, uh, in 1964, uh, running as a, a Republican uh, candidate, uh, is invoking uh, this notion of uh, it's not safe for 
uh, women or, or all people really to walk the streets calling uh, uh, on uh, for, for law and order, which essentially means a crackdown uh, on activism, on black protests. And that only becomes more heightened as we move into from the civil rights to the black power era, more explicit calls for uh, uh, change in society, uh, for a more equitable society. Uh, we really begin to see and hear these calls for law and order emanating not just from the South, uh, but from the states outside of the South, whether they're in the West, the North, uh, Michigan, Ohio, uh, et cetera. Which leads to a fundamental realignment of the political parties in America. Uh, and so one of the things that we're feeling today uh, and the, uh, the strength, uh, the basis of these various parties, especially of the Republican Party, has everything to do with the realignment of the parties that emerged out of the 1960s as a result of uh, efforts uh, to create uh, strengthened civil rights platforms. So in the 1960s, when you have uh, Lyndon Johnson signing on to the Voting Rights Act, or signing the Voting Rights Act, and signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, you have uh, Southern Democrats saying, uh, we're out. That's it. Uh, we're still going to be Democrats, but we're not going to vote for Democratic presidential candidates. Uh, and slowly, gradually, from 64 uh, to 68 to 72, uh, leading up to 1980, you see uh, white Southerners pulling out of the Democratic Party as African Americans move into the Democratic Party in the South. Uh, and by 1980, you have that wholesale change. Uh, in, in representation, uh, not just voting for Democrats at the top of Republicans at the top of the ticket, uh, but fully supporting uh, Republican candidates. And this was part of, uh, many of you know, Nixon's Southern strategy, uh, who was very clear, uh, and his insiders were very clear. What are we going to do? We're going to go after racist Southerners. Uh, that's what we want. That's how we're going to win nationally. Uh, they understood. Uh, disaffected Southerners who were upset with the Democratic Party, who have been Democrats since the Civil War, uh, were upset with the party and associating them uh, with advocating and advancing uh, basic civil rights for African Americans. When we think about what's happening today, uh, certainly coming out of the 2008 presidential election, and we think about the emergence of the Tea Party, and we think about Republicans, establishment Republicans, who were excited about this grassroots mobilization and who are now uh, 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 reaping, if you will, what they had encouraged then and are fighting for control of their own party. Uh, we saw something very similar uh, in 1948, uh, almost a, a foreshadowing of what we're seeing now uh, within the Democratic Party uh, when Harry Truman running for president. Uh, in 1948, decides to embrace a civil rights platform publicly. Uh, and Southern Democrats uh, bolt, uh, create the states' rights party, the Dixiecrats, with Strom Thurmond uh, heading, up, uh, heading up the party. Interesting, uh, a reporter asked Strom Thurmond at the time, you know, why are you getting all upset about uh, uh, Harry Truman uh, and his public advocacy of a civil rights platform uh, when essentially uh, FDR uh, had done and said many of the, the, the same things. Uh, and, and, and Strom Thurmond said, well, we actually believe that uh, Truman may actually do something uh, about it. Uh, and so therefore, uh, we have to sort of guard ourselves against it. We see in 48 them setting up laying the groundwork uh, for a willingness to bolt from the Democratic Party uh, on questions of race. Because up until that time, up until 1948, when we think about the 1930s into the 1940s, uh, Democrats felt secure in their position within the Democratic Party. Southern Democrats felt secure with their position in the Democratic Party. They had seniority uh, in Congress in various positions. They had disproportionate amount of control. Uh, and uh, over various key committees, uh, and they had uh, no worries or concerns about black voters in the South. So they were comfortable within the Democratic Party. Uh, and they had FDR um, uh, willing to bend uh, to their uh, 
racial imperatives, if you will, when it came to legislation, uh, because he needed their votes to get his bills, his New Deal policies out of Congress, out of committees, uh, and signed into law. So when we think about uh, the policy implications, and I'll wrap up here, when we think about the policy uh, implications of the rhetorical stances that uh, these presidential candidates are taking now, uh, I think we have to really have our uh, antenna raised. Uh, because when we, if we look back uh, to that New Deal era, uh, when you had a, uh, a person in the White House uh, who was willing and wanted to pass a progressive uh, legislative agenda leading to such legacy uh, bills uh, and, and laws and policies as uh, the Social Security Act, creating a social safety net. Uh, we also realize how those fundamental elements of uh, the New Deal were racialized. <coughs> the Social Security Act, for example, because of uh, Southerners, white Southerners, uh, because of their concerns of losing control over black laborers, uh, make sure that the Social Security Act excluded domestic workers and farm laborers, which, is, which in the South, domestic workers meant 90% of African American women. It's completely excluded, not, uh, Social Security does not apply to them. The Agricultural Adjustment Act, uh, same thing. Uh, here you have on the surface policy that can uh, positively benefit the lives uh, of the most marginalized people and the most marginalized become excluded because of the way the policy is implemented, saying that oversight is not going to be maintained in Washington where you have the possibility uh, of, of fair and just oversight, but it's going to be uh, allowed to be controlled at the local level. So when subsidies, uh, which really take hold in the 1930s uh, and will prop up the agricultural industry in America into the current century, when that's initially established, Power and oversight is given to those planners who had historically uh, excluded African American workers and small farmers as tenant farmers and sharecroppers. So the danger when we think about today that the rhetoric uh, is just rhetoric and we ought not worry about it, uh, I think is very real. Uh, the possibilities of this notion of, of where do you go from uh, when you begin to talk about uh, restricting the vote. Uh, when you begin to talk about uh, uh, people stealing votes, well, the, the, the logical extension of that uh, is to continue to pass laws that restrict voting rights, to make it more difficult uh, for people to register to vote. Uh, the likelihood when you begin uh, to talk about, when you begin to talk about how dangerous America is, uh, that uh, there's, there's a terrorist lurking around every corner, uh, in every mosque. Uh, we see the, the result of that becomes, it becomes more difficult to get any kind of uh, substantive uh, gun control legislation passed through Congress, despite uh, the, the continuing wave of mass murder. There are real policy implications for what's happening. Uh, the social safety net, environmental protection, all of these things be can become our policies that be can become racialized and therefore supported in those terms. And it can be done in a way that is so subtle now it's this last point. The, the idea of colorblindness, just the absence of racially explicit language from laws does not mean that it doesn't have, these laws and policies do not have a disparate racial impact. What's so unique about this moment is, particularly when it comes to race and presidential politics, is that we are seeing uh, 
no longer a willingness simply to settle around colorblind rhetoric. That we are actually going back to a time pre-1980, a pre-Southern strategy in which you're mobilizing people around very explicit racialized rhetoric, which goes against uh, a sort of normative view of how American history happens. There's, there's, a, there's a sense that American history is perpetual progress, that everything just gets better. When we think about race, you had slavery, yeah, but then you had freedom, and then you had civil rights, and then black folk can vote, and now you got a black president. That sounds like perpetual progress to me. <laughs> but the reality is that nothing is guaranteed, that you can easily backslide. So when you have a presidential candidate supported uh, and, and having his, his issues uh, echoed, talking about, well, we can just have mass deportation of people who are undocumented, another Operation Wetback, that isn't just rhetoric. Like, that is a call for new policy. And that just isn't uh, sort of something that can be dismissed fancifully because of a serious grassroots mobilization that we have seen on the far right over the last uh, six to eight years and knowing the history of how racialized politics uh, have impacted presidential politics and presidential races as well as the policy implications coming from it all. So the times that we find ourselves in, I would argue, are very serious with real world implications. Not for most of us sitting in this room, for example, uh, in terms of uh, us not being able to vote, although in 2000 it was rather difficult, uh, 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 2004 it was rather difficult for many, even here in Ohio, to, 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 to vote. Uh, but most of us are not going to lose our right to vote. It won't be wholesale disenfranchisement of African Americans anymore. But that's not the purpose of the legislation that we're seeing talked about. Because you don't need that many more to disenfranchise. Or you don't need to disenfranchise that many more to win major presidential elections. <coughs> that's the era that we find ourselves in. Today. And that's what I think we have to be cognizant of and wary of as we move into uh, the 2016 uh, actual presidential election. Thank you very much. Thank you, son. Fantastic. And uh, uh, you were cool under pressure. <laughs> And uh, uh, I, I noticed it, and uh, I, I wondered about this in the audience as well. Uh, unlike the typical direction that we think of a historian to take, right? You start, you know, with you know, Reconstruction or Civil War or something, and move forward. You started with the present and move backward, which I thought was a really interesting way to, you know, to, to do the analysis. Uh, you must have uh, questions, and I know Hassan uh, uh, will answer uh, uh, as vigorously as I'm sure he can. Questions for Hassan? seems like every day Trump is making more and more outlandish statements, crazy statements, and yesterday or the past couple of days he said that, oh, I'm so popular I could go out in the streets of New York and shoot someone and still win. Do you think that is a racist statement, given all the other racist statements he made? Do you think it's just on that same track, disguised perhaps? But uh, I mean... The, the acceptance of it, right? So it's all, one of the things, one of the uh, exercises I like to do um, in sort of trying to decode language uh, is not just what people say, but how it's received. So what would, you know, if Barack Obama had said, uh, well, I could just go out and shoot people and still be elected, uh, imagine what the furor and uproar would have been and how that may have been racialized. So sometimes, it's not even the statement, but it's how the statement is perceived. One of the things that we see uh, you know, that, that's connected to very much sort of white privilege. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Donald Trump could say something like that as a white male candidate, uh, and there won't necessarily be a fear, uh, or he's not tapping into this fear of a danger of white males as going out to shoot people. 
But if a Barack Obama or some other African American candidate, except maybe like a Ben Carson, clearly is a non-threatening non -threatening Negro I've ever met, uh, <laughs> if, if, if it's him, uh, then it falls back on these racialized stereotypes of sort of violence and danger. I mean, one of the things that we saw thinking about racial, racialized politics, uh, criticism very early on of Barack Obama was that he won't get angry. Right? I mean, he seems too cool. He, he, he's too much of, uh, of a college professor. Well, that's also warring against this idea of the, the, the always angry or potentially, uh, potentially uh, angry African-American man. Right? I mean, so this idea of, you know, is the statement racist, uh, but, it, you know, may or may not be, but how it's perceived and how it's received, perceived and received, is almost always racialized in some way. Uh, and I think that's, al that's almost as damning uh, when we think about sort of where we stand today in terms of race and race relations uh, than some, some, some of the uh, more explicitly outlandish things uh, that he actually talks about. Uh, but connecting that too in the moment of sort of Black Lives Matter and the defense of uh, you know, how that has been framed as sort of an assault on white cops and calling, I mean, to, to use that sort of rhetoric and just get a pass on it is actually quite stunning. Yes? I, um, okay. I'd like to, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, I'd like to ask a question about the uh, Democrat Party candidates. And I'm interested to hear how you see the debate going on at the moment in the media, amongst other commentators, about how Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders are approaching the issue of race and reaching out specifically mm -hmm. to the African American community. Um, Hillary, it has been said that Hillary is going straight out and is, uh, Reaching, reaching out to the Af African American community, whereas Sanders, and there's some evidence based on his responses to say maybe he's skirting the issue and concentrating on economic issues rather than treating race as the issue. I'd like to ask what you think about that. Yeah, so I think the Clintons uh, have uh, a particular resonance in the African American community. And if we go back to 2007, uh, 2008 presidential election, in 2007, I think it's important to go back there when Hillary's running against Obama. Going into Iowa, I mean, Barack Obama wins Iowa in part because uh, the moderate, or in part because the white vote gets split uh, between Hillary Clinton uh, and a guy called Edwards. Remember Edwards? <laughs> Random guy, so it's forgotten from history, right? That vote gets split, and so Barack Obama then is able, with 39% or whatever it was, to win Iowa. Iowa becomes critical for African Americans because prior to Iowa, most African Americans, most African American voters, with the exception of those who are, are really following politics, had no idea who Barack Obama was. I mean, they kind of had heard of him, they knew he was running, but you know, kind of who was he unless you really were following 2004 and at the, at the Democratic National Convention and the speech that he gave, unless you were really into politics, you, you didn't really have much of an idea who this guy was. Uh, if you look at polling numbers up until that point, uh, because clearly there's only three black people in Iowa, so outside of <laughs> Iowa, uh, the vast majority, some 75% of African Americans, if you poll them in 2007, were supportive of Hillary Clinton. Uh, and so, but once you move, once Barack Obama wins Iowa, then it's like, whoa, wait a minute. So you got a black candidate who's the Senate of the United States who just won Iowa, which is still next to Iowa, so I mean, which is still next to Chicago, you know, Illinois, so it's not, I mean, we think it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's, you know, not that far from Iowa. The, but it, it sends a ripple of shockwave, like, whoa, what's going on? Is this a viable candidate? The point is, African Americans were supportive of Hillary Clinton, overwhelmingly supportive of Hillary Clinton, and probably still would have been supportive of Hillary Clinton if it not for the candidacy of Barack Obama. Right? So if we fast forward to 2012, uh, and, and, and the Clintons understand this completely, Right? They're not shy about reaching out to African-American voters uh, and certainly are going to make a big push in South Carolina as they tried to do in 2008, but they came up against Barack Obama, or really they came up against Michelle Obama, who was rallying African-American voters in South Carolina. Well, you take out Michelle Obama, you take out Barack Obama, who are willing to reach out to the African-American community directly and explicitly and talk about policy in terms of race, which, Hillary, which Bill Clinton was a master at, which Hillary Clinton has no problems doing whatsoever, 
you compare that to Bernie Sanders, who very much is driven by uh, an understanding of the problems that people face, especially those in marginalized groups, as being economic, unless he comes with a much more explicit understanding of the ways in which the economic problems that face all Americans disproportionately dis uh, have a disproportionate impact on African Americans, he is going to have problems uh, with African American voters. He's going to have to do something very explicit in terms of his policies, in terms of what he says and how he says, in, in terms of engaging the African American community if he expects to make a big dent because the Clintons are known quantities, for better or for worse. The point is, it's Barack Obama, it's interesting, Barack Obama, as it, in, in, in 2008 especially, got a pass when it came to race and talking about racialized issues in the African American community from African Americans. He got a pass. African Americans said, you, you know, we understand that you can't say anything. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Wink and nod. Just, we know Michelle. We're good. <laughs> We're okay. A white candidate couldn't get away with that. Right? Hillary Clinton had to explicitly make clear her views on race and, and racism and policies as it relates to African Americans. So Bernie Sanders can't assume a, a, a Barack Obama stance. That's not going to work. He's not going to get a racial pass on that because he doesn't have he doesn't have that racial credibility. He doesn't have that street cred. And he's not married to Michelle, so he can't. That is, that's not going to help. So he's going to have to be explicit uh, in his in his policy and what he says, and he's going to have to do major reach, major outreach and organizing. Otherwise, he's not going to make a he's not going to have a real dent uh, in the large voting pop in the large. Uh, voting population of African Americans. He may make inroads among younger African Americans, college age and the like, with some of the economic policies, especially around uh, education and student loan reform. Uh, but the large African American community, I doubt seriously, will, will gravitate to him in the absence of explicit outreach and explicit racial policy. Thank you. Yes? I have to make an argument, um, I have to make an argument for voting rights in the minority community, and I am desperately trying a slant of design and communication with that because of the whole full pause that they've been having with, with communicating the process. And I'm just curious, can you give me any ambition to win so I can get the opportunity to present? So how do you mean? How do you mean? I have to be able to talk about what are some of the, I have to explore threats of voting in minority communities and factors that result in a lack of turnout in these communities. And so I found a lot of material, you know, talking about how um, voter rights are communicated differently in different communities. But I, I'm i not a political person, so I'm coming from a design aspect, so I'm very lost as to where to start to look for this data. Yeah, so, I mean, in, if, if you're looking specifically at Ohio, I think it's important uh, to look at um, some of the legislation that has been coming out of uh, the General Assembly uh, starting in 2010. Uh, because in, in 2010, there are a number of state bills uh, that are designed, especially actions of the Secretary of State, um, uh, that are designed to make it more difficult uh, for African Americans, for people of color, lower income, uh, new voters, uh, to participate in the electoral process. I mean, one of the things that happens, uh, that has happened, is a rollback or attempts to roll back early voting. Uh, the number of weekends uh, before a general election uh, that a person could register to vote, uh, attempts to uh, eliminate that final weekend uh, before uh, a major election. Uh, I mean, that, you know, in, a, in, in Cleveland, uh, Cuyahoga County, for example, uh, some 60% uh, of African Americans uh, in, I believe it was 2012, uh, cast ballots through early voting. 60%. Uh, so if you're talking about cutting into or making it, uh, creating less options, uh, less opportunities, fewer opportunities for people to, uh, rep to uh, uh, cast ballots, uh, you're going to have uh, a, a disparate impact uh, on those communities that do that. Uh, there was an attempt uh, in, in Ohio uh, to uh, not send out, to only send out absentee ballots uh, to those who requested them, uh, as opposed to just sending them out to everybody. 
Uh, now, naturally, you are going to lose part of a population uh, is not going to vote if they were going to vote absentee just by making just by making them uh, take that extra step. And again, this isn't going to disenfranchise everybody, uh, but it will disenfranchise some, uh, and that's and, and and that's a real and that's real uh, and can have a serious impact uh, on 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 any major uh, election, uh, both local, state, uh, and especially and especially federal. So I think if we look at some of those policies and how they're articulated. Uh, no, and I love it, and they're all attached to good design. Love it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, please. Um, maybe I'm echoing what the lady said. But my question is this: Is your disfranchisement so chilling, especially if you went through or you remember the Florida elections mm -hmm. and the uh, presidential Supreme Court decision mm -hmm. finally? Okay. Uh, but in closing your statement, you said you don't need to disfranchise to win an election. So I'm just wondering, uh, state level, federal level, what yeah. has been done so far? You know. Yeah. So I, I would just clarify: you don't need to disenfranchise everybody, right? The days of us wholesale disenfranchisement uh, are done, right? Uh, for the most part, anything is possible in this day and age. But we're not. You know, there was a time when. You know, the women could not vote, right? I mean, women have to popularly could not vote. African Americans in the South, in some states like Mississippi, uh, upwards of 50% of the population just simply could not vote. That's wholesale. That's mass disenfranchisement. We're beyond that. Nobody is going to. I shouldn't say nobody. Anything is possible in America. <laughs> I understand that. Uh, but the likelihood of that uh, is passed for the moment. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that disenfranchisement. Uh, suppressing the vote, people call it voter suppression now, uh, cannot have a chilling effect on these elections. Because we saw it in 2000, elect in, in 2000 with Bush v. Gore. I mean, the reason why George Bush wins uh, is because ba votes, ballots were cast out and, and, and literally tens of thousands of people in Miami-Dade, uh, people of color, uh, were not allowed to vote when they attempted to. We say in Jeb's state, in, in Jeb Bush's state, yeah. <laughs> for the conspiracy. Anyway, so uh, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's it's a reality, right? And so that's the danger when we think about uh, the wave of voter suppression bills that are rippling through America, uh, in Ohio, in Indiana, in North Carolina, uh, and, and we see them, and they will have a chilling effect. There's an argument uh, that has been put forth, looking at 2000, the 2012. Uh, election that said, well, 2012, 2014, uh, but especially 2012. They said, well, look, you know, you had some of these early disenfranchisement measures, and uh, the actual number percentages of African American voters vis-a-vis uh, -vis white voters was actually higher. So you had these you had these uh, laws on the books, and black voter participation went up. And so those who were advocating it said, well, in the aftermath. Well, there's no problem at all. You know, all the worries and fears that you have, you know, they're gone. Here's the problem. Uh, the reason why uh, it went up was because of a massive effort at getting out the vote, of voter mobilization and voter organization. And you also had an African American at the top of the at the top of the ticket. Uh, and so, the burden of uh, fair, free, and fair elections, the the, the burden of extending the franchise to as many people as possible shouldn't be borne by the people uh, who have the most challenges uh, in terms of getting registered to vote. In other words, African Americans should not have to bear the burden of having free and fair elections for Americans. And that's what we're, that's what we're asking of them. And so it's, it's a miracle, or it's not a miracle, there's very real reasons why uh, you had a strong voter turnout, but we just can't then say, well, therefore, those laws don't have and won't have a chilling effect, uh, because that is yet to be determined. And I guarantee you, coming into the 2016 presidential election, you will see a significant uh, dip, uh, more than likely, uh, in uh, black voter participation, uh, because you will not have the Obama effect, you will not have a willingness of people to sort of go through the hoops and hurdles to participate in the political process because of the difficulties that have been put, the barriers that have been put in front of them, and that's unfortunate. 
And that shouldn't be the case. We should not be making it more difficult to participate in the political process. We should be making it easier. And it's real simple to do. It's not difficult. Right? In a state like Oregon, for example, let's make it mandatory voter registration, automatic voter registration. Rather than rolling back, I mean, wh why is it that we can only vote on one day? Right? I mean, there's no reason why you can't have an extended voting period. I mean, there's so many easy things that can be done, but that get lost in uh, the rhetoric, uh, the rhetoric of today. Can you take one more? Yeah. yeah. One more question. Yes. Um, what other like minority groups are being like targeted by this dis disenfranchisement? Like, is um, certain things like with Hispanics or Muslims and different things like that, the new phobias or not new, but like these phobias that are more coming out in the open today, are they? Like, well, certainly, certainly with uh, Latino groups, um, when you move outside, uh, when you move into the Southwest, to California, for example, uh, Arizona, Texas, uh, you have a strong push to disenfranchise um, uh, those, those you, know, you know, folk there uh, under the guise of, again, uh, protecting and securing the vote to avoid voter fraud and ballot fraud, uh, which, which is a stunning assessment, right? I mean, in other words, ballot fraud, voter ID, voter fraud, identification fraud, does not exist, right? The, the people are not running into polls impersonating other people to vote, right? In fact, Americans as a whole don't vote, right? So the last thing they're doing is going in impersonating other people to vote more than once. It doesn't happen, right? And so this idea of, you know, you got to have vote, you got to have, and, and one of the, you know, following the Supreme Court's uh, uh, ruling in the Shelby case, which, which took out for the Voting Rights Act, uh, which eliminated the formula, saying you can't use the existing formula for determining which counties, which jurisdictions had to, had to submit any changes to voter policy to the federal government, to the Justice Department, to make sure it was on the up and up. That was the Supreme Court case uh, in Shelby. Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional, uh, you need to come up with a new formula. Well, under this current Congress that, that refuses to do anything, uh, there was no chance that they were going to come up with a new equitable formula that extended the reach to places like Ohio and Indiana where it needed to be, and not just in the former states of the Confederacy. Well, if you look at a state like Texas, Texas immediately said, uh, well, we are going to implement our new voter measures. So, for example, uh, they said that uh, students uh, from the University of Texas at Austin, for example, uh, could not use their student IDs, and Ohio tried to do the same thing, right? You could not use a student ID as a valid identification uh, from, from the, the flagship university in the state of Texas to register to vote. But you could use a gun license. <laughs> Welcome to Texas, right? And so, I mean, these sort of mechanisms, I mean, what are they designed to do? They're designed to pick off those groups that are traditionally voting uh, Democratic, uh, that might become, that might vote Democratic, uh, and certainly are voting against uh, a, a Republican, the Republican Party and Republican. And this, I mean, it, it's not, it, it's not unfair, or I'm not being biased when I say that these are measures that are being passed by a particular party. I mean, it is. That's what they're doing. These are Republican-controlled legislatures that are passing uh, specific. Uh, legislation that is being mirrored and copied state after state after state. I mean, this is what they're doing for the sole reason of making it harder for certain populations to participate in the political process. Whether it's African Americans, poor poor people, um, senior citizens, students, and Latinos. There was a kind of last thing. There was a conversation. I was flying to Montgomery, Alabama, very recently, and. Uh, I, I, you know, I got on a plane, you go to Atlanta, you hop on a little puddle jumper down in Montgomery, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama. And I, I take my seat, and, and, and two fellas uh, sit, sit, you know, it's a two-seater, so two guys sit next to me. And I'm, I'm actually going to give a talk in Montgomery, a nice civil rights talk about voting rights, you know, in the, in the, in the heart of uh, uh, sort of, you know, where the civil rights movement, some would say the civil rights movement was born. 
Uh, and these two fellows sit down, uh, you know, you know, middle managers. You know, they have you know the short sleeve shirts on. I mean, sort of middle, you know, you know, middle middle management fellows. And so one guy gets on his phone and he's sort of looking looking through, scrolling through the news. And he and he and he, he leans over and tells his buddy, he says, California, uh, and this is November. California uh, just made it possible for illegal quote, illegal immigrants to vote. And I'm sitting there like, what the hell are you talking? Like, what? Like, what is going? What? Like, huh? And so it, it took, and, and, it, and his partner says, yup, that's that makes sense. That's what they do out there, right? I mean, so they, I mean, they, they are unnerved, right? Like, oh my God, you know, California. This is what these, you know, this is what they, they eat granola and make it possible for uh, you know, you know, illegal immigrants, right? To, to the vote. This is what they do. Uh, and so it took me all of 30 seconds uh, to, 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 to take out my phone, uh, Google uh, California illegal immigrants voting, uh, to see that there was a, a conservative far right spin on legislation that the governor had just signed. Uh, that made it possible for people when they went in and got their driver's license mm -hmm. to be automatically registered to vote. That became uh, California is making it possible for illegal immigrants to vote. And it was confirmed by Billy and Bob <laughs> sitting next to me. Uh, and so, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I share that to say one of the problems. If we, Perhaps we get in here. One of the one of the problems that I think we we that we're facing today and that we have to take seriously uh, is uh, the nature of uh, our public discourse. Not just a matter of the civility, right? I mean, this, I don't know. The civility is now out the window, right? I mean, you know, folk on the far right say, "Oh, it's political correctness." No, you're just being nasty and racist, right? I mean, that's what that's what you're doing. But you know, toss that out. Uh, we have, we talked about this a little bit uh, in class today, this idea that all voices are equal, that all, all, all media accounts are equal. So for, for somebody, and it was one of these, one of these you know, far right conservative uh, uh, voices, activists, uh, to make that spinning interpretation, that gets broadcast uh, on, on sort of Fox News and the others as gospel truth. And it's not. It's just an inaccurate assessment of, and, and, and a highly politicized assessment of something that is, that is legitimate. And then what we then see is you will have those who take that side will be given equal airtime with those who are saying and who recognize that this is a problem. Right? And that, that portrayal of, of giving equal airtime to folk who don't deserve it because what you're saying is you're lying. It's like, you're, hello, they're lying. Why are they on the air, right? That is not the same thing as having an honest debate. And that's not about civility, right? I mean, that's about uh, the public square. And who are we allowing to participate in our conversations in the public square? And I think we have to do uh, a better job of of, of, of not, not just monitoring or policing, but saying, calling out, like, wait a minute, that's not a legitimate position. Right? The, the example that, that we talked about in class was like the birther position, right? Like, no, like that's not legitimate. Like, why are these? Why are you having folk debating the birther position? Uh, it's illegitimate. It does, it's not real. I mean, by giving them this platform, you're actually uh, uh, um, acknowledging or giving it, giving it legs and breathing life into it. And we just, have to, we just simply have to stop that. And, and that's just about the politics. Um, uh, that's just about democratic politics, right? Like small d democratic politics, regardless of uh, an individual's political affiliation. I mean, we just have to be uh, more serious, I think. Uh, in uh, what, what we say, what we listen to, more discerning, uh, and, and calling the media on it, right? Because it's not about political correctness or even civility, it's about honesty. 
right? Having an honest and candid conversation about the policies that are being promoted uh, in America. Because if we really want to move forward, I think, as a nation, then that is where we have to, where we have to begin. Hassan, I love the title of your, of your talk, especially the first two words, making sense. It's one of the things that we say, well, I guess I say over and over again in these Clear Society talks, is that this is something that historians are particularly good at. We're not just simply people that are interested in the past, but we are particularly good at helping all of us sort of make sense of what's happening right now. I think your talk clearly demonstrated that. Thanks. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Flyers for our next talk, we've got them back here. Uh, if you want email uh, 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 reminders about our talks, please sign up. Thanks, everyone.